Final hour overdrive continues. Brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hayes, Jonas Siegel of the Athletic, Leafs Panthers tonight. Joseph Wall will get the start. The Austin Matthews story is obviously taking up a lot of oxygen, as it should. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait to see what happens tonight. I'm curious to see how many Leaf fans are in the building tonight. If he scores, what happens in the building? Like, it's not on the PA announcer to make any special announcement if he scores, right? Yeah, it's funny. That made me think back to when Tavares got his 1,000th a thousand, a thousand point, it's hard to say, uh, in Long Island. And remember, the team all came onto the ice, mm-hmm. and then they actually acknowledged it in the building, which is a nice, like, classy thing to do. I just can't see them doing that for 70 goals. Oddly, even though 70 goals is more impressive. Yeah, the, you know the thing mean? is, 1,000 points is something that a lot of players can can uh, try to achieve or share. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, a, you, it's definitely an exclusive group. But it's almost like you're pumping the tires for a whole career as opposed to a season. Yeah. And I think it was especially highlighted there because it was in Long Island and Lamorello obviously had his connection with the Leafs. And I think Lou, it was Lou by all accounts who said, this is what we're going to do. And the Leafs had to get clearance from the team, right? To Or from the league to shut the game down. Yes. To correct. allow everyone on the ice to right. celebrate with him. Yes. Which is the right call. The Leafs should want to do that. And the league, I think, should allow for it. But that won't happen tonight. That's another thing that made that different is if Matthew scores tonight, makes it 70, the bench isn't going to clear. Should it? No, it shouldn't. No? Not, not for an individual achievement like 70, which is just an arbitrary number. So is 1,000 points, obviously. But that, that is a testament to just longevity and build up. And it puts you in this club that's very different yeah. where Matthews could score 70 and then not end on 70. You could get to 71 tonight, maybe plays tomorrow, 72. Who knows? Yeah. But how many people are going to be in the building understanding what is possibly on the line? And I guess if you're a Panther fan, you're walking in still wondering who they're going to play. Yeah. Because if the Leafs beat the Panthers, they play the Panthers. If they lose to the Panthers tonight... And Boston loses to Ottawa. The Leafs are going to Boston for game one, which we have not been wrapping our heads around for yeah. weeks. Well, can I turn this around on you? Who do you think Florida would rather face? Because if they win the division, they would play Tampa. If they don't, they play the Leafs. The Leafs. They'd rather play the Leafs. Absolutely. You think so? Yes. Tampa. Just because of Tampa's yes. pedigree? Tampa has owned that state for 25 years. Wow. I don't. Yeah, that's interesting. And the last time they played, I believe Tampa swept them a couple years ago. Yeah, that's how. So Florida doesn't have anything they can look back on in terms of playoff success against Tampa. They do with the Leafs a year ago. But Florida's also a different team, having gone to the final now. Yeah, they should. I think they'd be comfortable with either team. Like, I think Florida, and you look at the numbers like you have, like defensively, they're incredibly sound. Like they're one of, if not the strongest, you know, defensive team in the league. They've got Bob, who's been really good and he's healthy. Yeah. They're they're gonna have home ice. They have clutch players that were proved last year, from Barkov to Kachuk to Verhage. Reinhardt's having a career year. Mm-hmm. Sam Bennett's a playoff performer. Yeah, like they're loaded. In well, and I they, guess they're gonna be a really tough out. If I was picking goalies. I'd rather face Samsonov than well, and that's Lefsky. That's another part of it. Like it, Tampa's been at, almost as hot as the Leafs, if not as hot for the last you know month or month and a half. Yeah, Tampa's been really hot to get in. Vasilevsky's a big part of that, yeah. which would be terrifying. And Tampa has championship pedigree. The Leafs can't match that. Amazing power play, Kucherov. Who do you think Boston wants to play? <laughs> Like, do you think Boston would, in the back of their minds, be thinking we should lose Might be tonight? Might the same answer. Maybe? I think in Boston, it's the Leafs because they own the Leafs. Yeah, you kind of got to respect the champ. I know they're not the reigning champ, but yeah. they are the... Well, and, and Boston has not lost to the Leafs in the regular season in two years. And they've beaten them the last three times they played in the playoffs over the last decade. Like, if you're in Boston, you would, like, Boston Bruins fans would be relishing the idea of playing Toronto. Now, I would suggest watch what you wish for. Mm-hmm. And I think the Leaf fan, I, I've noticed Leaf fans are a lot more muted on this after the We Want Florida chance last year in that game seven, Florida Boston, where everyone, myself included, was saying, wow, this is incredibly beneficial for the Leafs. 
if Florida gets through. Yeah. Because Boston was the juggernaut they were, at least immediately had home ice. Everything was coming together for Toronto. But um, I don't get that sense from Leaf fans that they're even... Because they're both weighted evenly. They're both really good teams. Boston and Florida are really, really tough outs. So either either path is going to be a tough one for the Leafs. Yeah, and then whichever team, you're going to have to beat the other team regardless, right? In the second round. That's... Can I ask you? I'm struggling you play with the this. games. We talk about 70 goals. I don't know where to put Matthews on my Selkie Trophy rankings. So we get five picks. Mm-hmm. He's not winning it. Like, I have Barkov first. But, like, where would you put him? Would he that, be that, in your top five? Like, it's all... It's probably the hardest award, I think, to, to mm-hmm. sort out. Yeah, because it's not as in your face. No. Right? Like, heart trophies are largely based on point production. That's yeah. how you get into the conversation. Sure. Salki, there isn't a tangible number you can point to that puts you in that club. There are numbers, but like, there's not yeah. like one you can be like, yeah, that's it. Well, and he would have numbers in terms of takeaways. Yeah, block shots. Block shots. I think he could be in the top five. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't have an answer for you on the fly. Okay. But I have noticed that people have been pointing that out, that if this guy ends up nominated for the Salki... With 70 goals, how does he not win the heart? That was me. Like, I don't, that's yeah. why I have him first on my heart trophy ranking. Right. The top five in Selkie. It's never 70 happened. 70 goals, but not the heart. Never happened. Yeah, exactly. You've never had a Rocket winner also win the Selkie or be nominated, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unprecedented. Right. Well, you think about who's won the Rocket. Like, McDavid wasn't nominated last year. No. Prior to that, it was Matthews every year. Prior to that, it was Ovechkin. Ovechkin's never been up for the Selkie. Not even close. Yeah. Yeah, we're, that will be uncharted territory. If he's yeah. a finalist for the Selkie and a finalist for the Hard. I swear, I think it's being somewhat underrated. Like, I think the fact that he had 60 goals a couple years ago has made this a little more muted mm-hmm. league-wide than maybe it should be. But yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm with you on that. It's going to be an awesome night, though. you got Leafs, Panthers... Panthers and Bruins both playing to see who's going to win the division. And then you've got a boatload of games in the East that are going to determine who gets that last spot. Washington playing tonight. Detroit playing tonight. you got Pittsburgh who still has to win and then really hope for a lot of different things to break their way. But the Islanders punched their ticket last night. Patrick Watt got that team into the playoffs. The players obviously got that team into the playoffs. And a man that's very familiar with playing there and playing in the East throughout his career here is NHL Network analyst and former NHLer Thomas Hickey. How you doing, Thomas? Hey, guys. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for doing this. So, obviously, you're up close and personal with the Islanders a lot. How much of their recent play and their pursuit of the playoffs and ultimately clinching a playoff spot, how much of the credit do you think should go to Patrick Waugh? Uh, a, a good share of it. I mean... You know, that's a group that wasn't in a playoff spot when he took over. So clearly, you know, he's put it in a better spot um, than than they were when he inherited the job. But, it, you know, it's not like it was without growing pains. I think, um, you know, they, they were just playing a style of hockey that earlier in the year before Lambert was fired, it just wasn't really sustainable. Uh, and what Patrick Waugh came in and did is he's, he's got them playing a more structured game in their own end, but he's got them with competing a lot harder and being a lot tougher to play against. And I think that's the biggest thing that he's, that he's done. I think he's been a great motivator and you've got, you know, a bunch of guys that they clearly care, but they weren't getting their all. And I think Patrick was come in and just sort of brought a life to that group. And I give him full credit and the guys have stepped up. I mean, he's got some, some big performances in that when he really needed to, and he, and he pushed a lot of buttons as well. This is a group that, on paper, doesn't look anything like it would have opening night of the season just with the way he's moved bodies around. Yeah, and in terms of the, the goaltending position, Varlamov, like it, it was Sorokin's team, and you know the last four or five years, I, when we speak with goalie experts, they say obviously Vasilevsky's the king, Shesterkin's thrown his hat in the ring, Hellebuck. But Sorokin was a guy that was always in that conversation as one of the four or five best goalies in the league. And yet it's Varlamov, who's a veteran, who's done it before, that kind of pushes them over the top. And it was Waugh that kept riding them. And I'm curious if you think 
his history at that position, like how, how big of a role did that play in his analysis of who he should go with and maybe having the courage to say Varlamov's going to be the guy to get us to the promised land, even though Sorokin is the guy that holds the title as the number one goalie there. Yeah, I don't even think, uh, you know, with respect to the way you phrase that, I don't even think it's courage. I, I think it's a gut. Uh, you, you mentioned Patrick Waugh, and obviously, you know, name is synonymous with great goaltending. So he obviously, he's got the pulse for it. Uh, but I think people, you know, you can look over the fact that when Patrick Waugh won the Jack Adams Award as the top coach in the NHL, who, who was in that for him? It was Semyon Varlamov. So he's got a trust in that goaltender, and Varley's just been so good uh, at every stop. Every time uh, you need a save or a start uh, down the stretch here, he's leaned on Varley, and Ilya Sorokin's game, he was so good last year. Like, I, I think he was the best in the world, and you know, neck-to-neck neck with Linus Allmark, and he hasn't been quite that way, but what this has allowed him to do is get some reps and, and time to practice and just sort out his game just a little bit. And I think you saw the results of that against the Rangers on Saturday. He was, he was brilliant. Him and Shesterkin going head to head. It was fun to watch and fun to see Elias Sorokin back to that level. So I think it's a good problem that they, that they have. Uh, I think it buys time for Sorokin. And I've said it to a few people now that, you know, that they're going to be playing the Carolina hurricanes, uh, not too many areas. The Islanders, line up well with the Hurricanes, but one of them is in net. They've got two great goalies, and I think you'll probably see both of the Islanders' goaltenders in that series. I'm not saying that I think Barlamov's going to get blown out at all. I, I just think you have that luxury of two good guys. Uh, if things aren't going your way, he's one of those guys that has ability to, to win a game for you flat out. So, Thomas, that is the case? Like, Varlamov is going to be their game one starter? No, uh, that's oh. not the case. Uh, that's that's not what's been said. So, it, you know what? I, I'm just going with my gut or my logic. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Varlamov's been been awesome on every single start that he's had uh, in the last month, and he's gotten wins every single time. So, I think he's the guy. Um, I think would play tomorrow just to get him uh, another game and get Varlamov some rest, but. Uh, if you're going just based off of the last month, it's really propelled them into the playoffs. Varlamov's been the guy when they needed a win, they go to. So I think you'll see him game up. That has not been set in stone. With uh, Thomas Hickey of the NHL Network, and we got a wild one tonight because Detroit, they storm back last night, tie it late, win it in overtime to keep their dreams alive. Washington wins yesterday. Washington playing tonight. All they have to do is get a win. They get two points they're in. They're playing Philly. Philly needs to beat them in regulation to keep their hopes alive. And then you got Pittsburgh, who's been great recently, and Sid's been outstanding, and they're hoping to get in, but they need a lot of things to break their way. Um... I guess we'll ask for a prediction here. Washington, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philly. Who do you think will get the last spot in the East? The team that has the, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I just did uh, a show on NHL Network, and going through the scenarios, it's, it's nauseating. There's mm -hmm. too many variables, but the one that stands out is the Washington Capitals. And, you know, playing against Philly, who's going to be rested, it is a tough back-to-back, -to -back, but... They only gave up 16 shots last night against the Boston Bruins. So Lindgren's sort of the reason they're in this state that they are right now with the chance to seal a playoff victory. And he didn't see too much work last to benefit. That's a bonus for them. I think John Carlson might play, you know, he's definitely going to play upwards of 30 minutes at even strength. If the game goes into overtime, he'll play even more. Uh, they're so banged up on the blue line. I'm not sure how they've managed to stay in like they have, but Washington is definitely – got the clearest shot to it and I'll be calling the game tomorrow between Pittsburgh and the Islanders and if that game means something I mean I'll be excited for it because it would be fun to watch Sidney Crosby try to will his team in but uh, I, I think things might figure themselves out tonight. Well Thomas if you were thinking for the New York Rangers which of those teams would you be most I guess afraid is not the right word but like of those teams who would you least want to play Detroit, Pitt, Washington, Philly? Uh, I probably least want to play Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just, it just because of the pedigree that they have, they've been there before. I, I think Washington is, I, I talked about the injuries on the back end and as much as they're 
uh, finding a way to stay relevant and maybe sneak in. I think that depth on the back end could could really hurt them. Uh, you know, not built the same way that they have been in the past. Philly's just not in a good place right now. So uh, if you would ask me a month ago, that would have been a tough matchup. I, I think the the team that stands out the most to me would be not wanting to see Pittsburgh if I'm the Rangers. With Thomas Hickey of uh, the NHL Network, once we get there, once a team gets in, obviously in the East, then, then we'll have all 16 teams because we know Vegas, Nashville are in, LA's in in the West. Uh, obviously, the Islanders clinched last night. So we're real close. And a lot of these teams, like Boston, Toronto, Florida, the Rangers, they've wrapped up the President's Trophy, Dallas, Winnipeg, Vancouver, Edmonton. They, they've been in it for months. They know they're going. They don't necessarily know who they're playing yet. Um, but do you are you a believer in like rust building up before the playoffs if you if you haven't been playing for anything necessarily like if you if you know you're going to the playoffs you kind of have an idea of where you're going to start um is that a positive or do you think it it could be a negative because you know maybe you get a little bit rusty or you take your foot off the gas before the real stuff starts yeah i think it can be a negative uh, there's no doubt but the one thing that that i think is at most, that rust is, is going to last one game. And if it is, that's too bad because that could be the difference in a series. But um, that's why coaching is so important. And, and I think the hard part for a lot of teams is managing not being too hard on your team when you've been in a playoff spot and you've clinched for three weeks, uh, knowing when to ramp that group up. And, uh, you know, in Tampa Bay earlier this year, John Cooper was, you know, having a conversation about, the fact this year is different for them, and he, he sort of likes it, the fact that they haven't had their foot off the gas. They haven't had to try to time it out um, and, and sort of you know, have, that, have that soft landing where they're ready to go come game one, coming off of games that don't mean too much. Um, so it's different for Tampa this year, and I think for, uh, for some teams, if, if you haven't been in that situation before, it's probably hard to make sure that those bad habits creep out. But the one thing going this year is, Every team's playing for seeding. Uh, even the teams, the best in the league, like the Rangers or the Dallas Stars, uh, you've got something in mind, like the President's Trophy or uh, making sure you have home ice advantage for the Winnipeg Jets or Colorado. So uh, at least those teams have been able to stay sharp in that sense. It's not like where Boston was at, at this time last year. Always great catching up with you, Thomas. I know it's a busy time of year. We appreciate you doing this, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Thank you for this. For sure, guys. Take care. Thomas Hickey of the NHL Network, former NHLer. Yeah, uh, I guess the Islanders, I mean, Carolina's been great. Like, Carolina has been winning every single night. It's a testament to how good the Rangers have been. Yeah. That Carolina's been this good, and they still couldn't catch them. But um, the Islanders are probably not a team you want to play right now. It's like Nashville in the West. They've been cooking for like two months to get in. Yet, generally speaking, the best team... It's probably going to win the series. I mean, the Stanley Cup playoffs is a complete crapshoot, but I don't know. There's a lot of parity in the league. We'll see. Do you trust, like, the Hurricanes goaltending? Do you trust, now that they have Gensel, that they're going to be able to score? Like, I think they're a really good team. I do, too. I think Freddie Anderson, since returning from his very latest good. injury, he's been really good. Yeah. But it's definitely a question mark. But if Varlamov's going to start... What a crazy story that is, hey? Yeah. Like, Sorokin was second for the Vesna last year. But the other guys just played better. That's precisely what's happened. And you got to go with your hot hand. It's like Nadalkovich and Pitt. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's Lindgren in, uh, yeah. in Washington. Like, they're, when you're desperate, you, you ride whatever you have to to get in. Yeah. Florida did that last year. Yeah, Alex Lyon. Yeah, Lyon was just playing. Like, Bob was there. Alex Lyon started the playoffs. Yeah. Bob was on the bench. The highest paid goalie in the league. Yeah. And then look what he did once he got in there. And he just got in there because Maurice was like, what, what do we have to lose? Like, put him in. Let's see what happens. I think, did he replace him during a game? Yeah, like the Lyon, Boston series, right? Yeah, it was the Boston series. But I feel like Lyon got pulled and Bob went in and played really well. Maybe they came back and won. And then the rest was history. They never looked back. All right, Steve Phillips on the Jays getting some reinforcements back. Eric Swanson is activated, and Jordan Romano is activated. The Jays game two series against, uh, or game two of the series against the Yankees goes tonight down at the Rogers Center. So we'll catch up with Steve 
Get his tee up on that. We'll get to our best bets later in the hour. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. All right, best bets brought to you by FanDuel later in the hour. Jays Yankees tonight. Big win last night. Big win. Chris Bassett looked good. We haven't talked about one thing that we should talk about at some point. What do you have? Juan Soto? No. Wow, he's been great, Mm -hmm. as expected. Of course. Play in tournament tonight. Yes, the NBA. And it's like, I think of uh, baseball and and kind of the way they've set up their playoffs. Mm -hmm. And obviously the NBA with the play in. And it just got me thinking, like, what would it be like if we just had those Detroit, Pitt, Washington, all those teams, the 7 8? If there was a play in tournament, how much fun that would be. Like, we're just missing out. Yeah, it is a good comparison right now with the NHL because all these teams would be in. Philly would be in, yeah. right? It would be probably Pitt, Philly playing the 9 10 game, I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Washington, Detroit. Detroit, or some combination. Maybe Pitt not because Washington would be, be eight. Maybe Pitt would no, be in. No, Philly, Philly would be, would be in. Yeah. Yeah, but the Islanders would still have to play. Yes. Instead of clinching and being one in. game, like think how fun like the yeah. NBA situation is. Like Steph and the Warriors have to beat Sacramento tonight, and then they have to beat the winner of the Lakers and Pelicans. And Pelicans. Just to get in. Just to get in. That's so fun. Yeah. Like, I don't just... like their chances at all. I think they could beat Sacramento tonight. They will, I think. You think they will? I mean, they've been, they've been playing a lot better down the stretch. They've been great. Right? And they did beat them last year in the playoffs. And they can beat the Pelicans, but it's just like... Oh, you think the Pelicans will beat the Lakers? Or you think the no, Lakers will beat the, the Pelicans? Lakers will beat the Pelicans. The Lakers will get through, and then the Pelicans will play at home against whoever wins. Well, and there's this Sacramento. whole conversation about whether the Lakers should lose this game to avoid the first-round matchup with Denver, which yes. is something. But yeah. I was just thinking how much fun it would be if the NHL just had, like, Pittsburgh playing Detroit in a one-off just to get in. So it doesn't... I agree that the, the play-in has been largely successful. It doesn't cheapen anything for you. Like, L.A., like, I do wonder in a scenario like this if the NBA would have preferred to go back to 1v8 for this time because then the Lakers are guaranteed in and they play Oklahoma City in the first round, a team they could probably beat. Yeah. Now you lose Golden State, but Golden State may give you one more game. Like the Warriors and Steph could lose tonight and they're out. What if the Lakers lose and then lose to Sacramento and they're out? Like that's a worst case scenario where yeah. you could have had a situation if you kept conventional wisdom, only top eight, the Lakers are home free and they're in. I think the goal is to generate interest and excitement and make your playoffs interesting. This is interesting. Like this I, is interesting. I want to watch and I would want to watch it in the NHL. Just like I love the wild card in baseball. Like it's become more, the stakes just feel higher. mm mm-hmm. Short well, and series. I like what they've done with the wild card that they've expanded it to best two out of three. Yeah, right. and benefit the them. it was crazy. Yeah, like a one off, game, yeah. a one t, a one game. It was cool. It was incredibly cool. Yeah, but I, I don't think it fit the nature of the sport. No, true. it should be best two out of three. Whoever had the better record or won their division should have home field. And it's isn't it all three are? Yeah, you get all three at home. Yeah, and that's another thing in the in hockey that I'd love to see more of home ice advantage. Like, mm-hmm. Anyway, Although I don't know just, if home ice advantage or home field advantage really a, applies in hockey or baseball. Like you, you definitely would have better uh, standings. You'd rather home, have it, but like in the NBA, place. it's really pronounced. Yes, like home court is massively beneficial. Yeah, in the NBA, mm-hmm. home field in the NFL generally is too. But yeah, like the Jays have been in the wild card twice. The first two, the first one was against Seattle. Didn't get to a game three. Mm-hmm. Would have been a game three at the Dome. Last year, obviously, didn't get to a game three in Minnesota. Yeah. But uh, I think the NBA, if they had a choice, they would like to guarantee more games of the Lakers. Like, if they could revert back and start this play in next year somehow, they would much prefer the Lakers were definitively in, guaranteeing the four more games of LeBron. They're going to be fine. You think they'll get through? Yeah. I think the NBA probably, though, should be wanting Lakers Denver because that would just be a bonanza. Yeah. I think Denver would win that series. I do too. I think most people would be picking Denver, but it would be a pretty incredible series to see. Well, they swept them last year in the conference final. I don't see anyone beating the Nuggets. Like, if they're healthy, I don't see... I saw a report today that there's concerns about Kawhi Leonard again. Well, his like knee is not played the last bit because of his knee. His, that, yeah. That's always going to be a thing. Yeah. They might lose. Although it was Dallas. announced that he's going to play in the Olympic Games. You see that? 
No, like, I don't just think came it out was. The, no, he's like in. He's a candidate for the last spot. I, I know, but the reports are coming out like this hour. Oh, I didn't that see that. It's, it's going to be Kawhi. It should be. Yeah, well, he should be if he's but healthy. He's but how can you rely on Kawhi Leonard? Right. But uh, yeah, it sounds like that inflammation in his knee is like really concerning in terms of actually playing in the playoffs. Because they just have not benefited enough from that contract. They I mean, the bubble conference year. conference final, and that's it. Yeah. That was in the bubble, too, wasn't it? Was it was a conference final. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, in the bubble, I don't even recall what they did back then. Like, was it still East versus West? I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it was normal. Yeah, I guess they completed the yeah. season down there. That's true. No, I don't the think next... they made the conference final. Anyway. I don't know. Anyway. Um, all right. Jays Yankees tonight. And the Jays coming off a big win last night. Reinforcements joining them starting tonight. Swanson back, Romano back. Jays are above 500. Here's Steve Phillips, our TSN MLB analyst. How you doing, Steve? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, Kawhi Leonard in the Olympics sure sounds like an international incident on the verge of happening. Yes, it does. Like, how could you possibly trust that guy that he is going to be there, he's going to play, he's well, going to be healthy? Well, did you see the rest of the roster? They do not need him. Well, that's another part. He may not play anyway. Like, no, he'd probably be a rotation healthy, guy. He's, play. he's one of their, if he's healthy, he's one of their best players, but they have other best players. Is he? I don't he's, know. When he's at his best, I mean, when, when was the last time he was at his best? This year. This year? This year, he, he's had some stretches where he's like, at his prime, Kawhi, Kawhi? capital, no. Kawhi. Stop I'm, it, Jonas. All right, I'm telling you. Stop it. All right. No, he was good, but they, he got kicked out of those games that he was at his best. Yeah. See, there you go. Steve knows what's up. Don't argue with Steve. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be frustrating as a manager though when you have a like a, a just a great talent that you can't rely on because they're hurt all the time. Oh, it doesn't matter what sport it is, right? I mean, it really doesn't matter. And typically, if it's a great player, you've invested a lot of money in it, and it's a lot of money sitting on the sideline, unable to perform for you. And you know, look, it's one thing if you lose, you know, a player like a number five starter, you can replace that because you know, you've got other guys who could have been the number five starter, but you can't, you can't replace the superstar. You can't replace the running back, the quarterback or your ace pitcher. Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, and, and certainly for Kawhi, he's such an impact guy. You know, it is a challenge for them. And whenever he either gets ejected or goes down with an injury. So, yeah, exactly. And, and in terms of where the Jays are at and their concerns about injuries, you know, before we get to the guys coming back and how they've, really survived without Romano and Swanson, which is a true accomplishment in terms of wins and losses. Uh, Kevin Gosman, his last couple of outings, Steve, it's, it's been a struggle. Um, his numbers are very bloated. He's getting hit and hit hard. We know that he was banged up in the spring. He only had one start in the spring. It was right at the end of spring training. Is it still him catching up, or is there something deeper here that might lead to some concern for the Jays? Boy, every time he pitches and he gets knocked around, I keep thinking that they're going to come out and say, you know what, we're going to put him on the injured list, and mm -hmm. his shoulder's flaring up on him. Just that it's, he's, you know, his velocity came back this last time, which was good, but command is the name of the game. You know, and if your velocity's down, you better locate your pitches, and even if your velocity's good, you better locate your pitches, and that's the thing that's missing. And sometimes with an injury, it's not the velocity that's the first thing to go. It's the command. Now, I mean, they keep saying he's okay, and, and this is the normal sort of April for him. I don't remember last April being like this uh, for him, so I am concerned about it. Uh, I think that uh, the good news is uh, Jose Barrios is pissed out of his mind. Uh, Chris Bassett looks like Bassett again. Kikuchi's been okay. This will be a good matchup tonight against Rodon, but you know, I do think that, that the Gosman aspect of this is a huge, huge deal for the Jays. They need him right, and they need him at his best. Well, Steve, speaking of starting pitching, Hayes and I were talking before about the Jays and developing pitchers. Why do you think some organizations are really yeah. good at developing starting pitchers and others, maybe like the Jays, aren't? Yeah, I think, I think every organization is different. Cleveland's the best. They, they just continuously have a line of, of pitchers that come through that, that uh, can get the job done for them. But I think it's, you know, a lot of it is analytics. A lot of it is scouting. You know, it's not only about velocity anymore, but I got to tell you that, that, you know, I, my belief has always been, you can go get pitching. There are guys who have failed in certain places that they get a fresh start and they you know, next thing you know, they step in and do a good job. Look at Michael Lorenzen. Like, you know, I mean, he was a reliever for a long time, you know, went, made it the all-star team for Detroit last year, got traded to Philadelphia, uh, threw a no hitter to the, for the Phillies when he went there. 
And then he sort of faded away and had to wait a while to get a job. Then he goes back to Texas. So you can find pitching, I think. Mm -hmm. Much harder to find an everyday position player. And so, you know, but uh, I think that developing an ace uh, goes a long way because it saves you so much money, you know, to be able to not have to pay a guy, you know, uh, $30 million to be able to get the job done. Uh, and so, uh, 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 and so it's, it is certainly a, um, uh, a, an issue, uh, that the Jays have, you know, have not developed their own. I mean, Pearson was supposed to be that guy mm -hmm. and he never seemed to fulfill that potential, uh, and, and become that ace. And, and, you know, and even that he's not even the most dominant reliever, uh, at this stage of the game. And so, you know, I think that, that developing pitching is a big part of it. The Indians, the guardians, I guess we call them now are the best at doing it. And those organizations that have a good job of doing it, small markets, particularly look at Tampa Bay, although they go out and they, they know who to acquire and when to acquire them yeah. from other organizations, and then they fix them. That's the other thing with analytics. You can get a guy and turn him into something better than what he's been. With Steve Phillips, our, our TSN MLB analyst. So uh, Romano is back and Swanson is back. You mentioned Pearson. They've optioned him to the minors, I believe to, to AAA. Um, and Mitch White, they've designated for assignment. But that was a huge story breaking camp. Like, how do you survive without your, your closer and basically your number one setup guy? And when the dust settles here, Steve, they're nine and eight. Um, it seems like a, a decent job. I mean, better than that. They've patched it together. It hasn't always been pretty. There have been decisions that have caused some concerns up here, or at least have the fan bases fired up. But again, they've kind of gotten through a lot of these fires that we've been talking about, including the guys I just mentioned who are now activated and back with the team, and they're above 500. Yeah, no, I agree. And, and yet, this division, Tampa Bay's 9-8, and eight, Boston's 9-8, and eight, mm -hmm. uh, and you look at Baltimore and the Yankees, you know, in front of them. And so, it is a really tough division, and people can keep saying, well, maybe it's not as strong this year. It is. Uh, and I think for Toronto, the fact that the offense hasn't been, you know, what they would have liked early on. Vladdy's not really Vladdy yet. Bichette's not Bichette yet. Uh, they've been able to, to win some games, right? And that's really what you have to do. Uh, timing matters. Big hits in a certain situation matter. They're, you know, they've done a good job getting through it. I am a little worried about Romano and, and uh, Swanson still. You know, they didn't pitch great mm -hmm. uh, on their rehab assignments. And I know we dismiss it. But what we do is we, you know, when a guy pitches well, we think, oh, great. Now he's coming in. He's ready to go. We're setting him up to succeed. When he's not, we say, well, you know, it was just we wanted to make sure he was healthy. You know, we justify it. But, you know, neither one of them has had great command. Romano has given up, uh, you know, a fair, fair share of walks in his rehab uh, assignment. Uh, and Swanson's given up some hits. Now, I love both those guys when they're healthy and locked in. But it's going to take some time, and my guess is they're going to throw them right into high-leverage moments, uh, and uh, we'll see if they're ready to go. Because, you know, once you're rolling like this, you don't want to have these guys come back and then lose a game where, you know, you think you, you, Jimmy Garcia might have been able to get the job done in the ninth inning. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how ready these guys are. Yeah, it's, it's kind of playing out in a similar fashion to what we saw last year, which, again, was 89 wins in the playoffs. Like it, it obviously didn't go anywhere in Minnesota. It's not, you don't get a banner because of that. It's not something that fans necessarily want to see. In fact, I think fans will turn on it and be really disappointed with it. Yet it's like patchwork that's good enough for them to stay together and stay in a race. And it's still very, very early. But I saw stats on this earlier this morning that runners in scoring position through 17 games, they are still dreadful. Like their numbers, their team OPS is 643. They have one home run with runners in scoring position through 17 games. Like, it's eerily similar to last yeah. year. Um, and is 17 games enough for us to just believe it will be the continued same story? Have they made adjustments? Are they trying anything different? Like, what do you make of what was plaguing them last year still continues to plague them at times this year? Yeah, I mean, I mean, here's the thing. We don't really know the whole story yet, mm -hmm. but and it's only a tenth of the season yep. uh, when you think about it. So, but... You know, I mean, typically there are other organizations where they didn't, weren't very good last year at doing certain things, and now they're better at it. Uh, and, you know, look at Detroit and what they're doing. Detroit's hitting with running scoring position. They're hitting, they're pinch hitting. They're getting pitching done. They didn't do it last year. Uh, and so, you know, you look at some teams that have actually, you know, not replicated the preceding season. And so it is a bit concerning. But we also know it is early. They can't get things going. Bichette and Guerrero have not gotten hot yet. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, Jansen's back and he's going to put a little pressure on Kirk to get him hitting a little bit, which we're seeing some response right there. And so, you know, I think that it's, it's too early to tell, 
But I'm with you. I'm not buying uh, the presentation that the internal improvements have actually improved just yet. And so I think it remains to be seen. But, you know, they're, a, they're considering everything. Nine and eight's not so bad. Well, Steve, are you buying the Yankees as a potential division winner? I think they can. But, you know, like, for instance, Rodon's so critical to them without Garrett Cole. He's got to pitch like the ace. If, he, if, he's, and, you know, if he starts to fade away like he did last year, then the Yankees are in trouble. I mean, Nestor Cortez wasn't great the other day. Uh, and so, you know, I think the Yankees have had some very good fortune so far. They've really hit on days they needed to hit. Uh, their bullpen's been excellent for them, which has been a big, big uh, issue uh, for them. They've been able to weather the loss of uh, Jonathan Belizega. Uh And so, I mean, the Yankees are a good team, but I don't think that they're an unflawed team. I think there's, they've got their own weaknesses and, and problems on their roster. And the Orioles haven't really hit stride yet either, and they're going to. Uh, so, I mean, I think the Yankees are certainly a team to be reckoned with, but they don't scare me. And, and I think that the Blue Jays certainly aren't playing them like they're scared. Jays, Yankees tonight. Uh, it's going to be a fun one. We'll do it again soon. Thank you, Steve. You bet, guys. My pleasure. Anytime. Steve Phillips, our TSN MLB analyst. Yeah, your boy Juan Soto didn't look so great last night, Jonas. <laughs> look at his numbers for the year. He's been great. He's been He looks like a Yankee. Like he, he's I know. got this. I got to tell you, as like his biggest fan, the stuff he does in the batter's box would drive me crazy. Yeah. Like, he's almost like he does this thing where a pitch will come in and he'll watch it go and he'll just, like, look at it and he'll be like, all right, that's what you got. Well, he'll put his head down and, like, stare yes. it in sometimes. Yes. Which is totally unnecessary. He'll, like, shake his head and be like, that's what you got? Okay. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. Listen, he's he's an immense talent. Yeah. Uh, and if it works for him this year, he knows he's going to get paid in New York. Yeah. Like, if, he has a, if this continues and he has a massive MVP caliber season, he's staying a Yankee. He'll sign a 10-year deal or something. And, or what? Did you see that I, report? Yeah, but I don't think... Like, baseball's changing, man. Look what's going on this offseason. Like, the monster... I think he has done himself a disservice. He might be different because... He's in his own class. He maybe. could be... Well, Otani was in his own class. But Otani represented something completely different, more so than, than Soto. Soto is not the same marketable player that Otani was and is. Counters, Soto's a lot younger. Counter to that, he's not a pitcher. But that's it. Like, it's not about building a team and who you think makes the best, the most sense in terms of the next ten years of winning and losing. Mm -hmm. With Otani, it was the it was all about the marketing. Plus, he is who he is. I mean, he hits home runs. He's a great hitter. If his arm returns, and I'm not convinced he's going to return after this long of an absence and just be a stud again. But it's tough to bet against him because he's been so good. And if you can get four years of him pitching and hitting at that height, yeah, he, he that's just a different category than every, anything we've seen in sport. Soto is a conventional example of a great ball player at a really prime age. He's probably still going to make a fortune. Like Aaron Judge a couple of years ago still made $40 million a year on a long-term deal. Yeah. So I would think Soto would expect and will probably get similar numbers in terms of per year. But I don't know if it's like blowing past Judge per year on a ten or twelve year deal. I, yeah, I think baseball is changing, man. So you do, you're saying teams aren't going to be willing to do that kind of stuff? There, there seemed to be some collusion this year. You think? Yeah. Yeah, like something went down here where even the the big bad Scott Boris had to chew on it a lot. Like Blake Snell's winning Cy Youngs, yeah. and he's sitting there getting nothing in terms of offers. Jordan Montgomery was really good. But see, the part I struggle there. with is, like, why all of a sudden would that change? There's no, like, analytics are in. We've had them a while. What changed all of a sudden where teams are like, you know what, we're not going to give these mid-tier or even high-tier free agents mm -hmm. long-term deals. Why? I, I don't have the answer for you on that. I mean, most of those deals don't really work out. So mm -hmm. Maybe there. I think maybe the players have to take some responsibility on that. That they turn down offers and then teams say, all right, well, that's what it is, so see you later. We'll move on to someone else. I think that's happened. Like, I think Matt Chapman might have been in that situation. I believe the Jays offered him more money, more term. Like, that's been reported. I don't know that definitively. He turned it down. That might happen with Soto. Like, Washington was deferred money and all that, but Otani just did that. They offered him $450 million or whatever it was. He turned yeah, it down. I think it was like a 13-year contract, so... 
still, it's four hundred and fifty million. Yeah. He may not get that. I'll take the over. He's gonna get it. You think he'll get yeah. you think the his deal will be worth more than four hundred and fifty, or yes. over the course of his career he'll make that the rest of the way. I think like the deal will be more deals, and I think it'll be yeah. I don't think he's making five hundred million dollars. I do. I do. How like he, I think he's twenty five. Yeah, he's in his mid twenties. Yeah, he's twenty five. Mm-hmm. He's getting it. So it'll be twenty six. Ten year deal. Although maybe he doesn't want a ten year deal. Ten year deal at fifty million a year. You yeah. think he's going to make fifty million a year when Judge just signed for forty? I think he's, and 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 just hit sixty two home runs. He's better than Judge. I don't know if he's better than Judge. He's not a better or more revered Yankee than Judge, which uh, is important yeah. here. He, I don't know if he ever can catch up. Yeah. I guess he can if he's there for a long time and he's the man on a uh, and they win a World Series. Judge hasn't done that. Yeah, but Judge is beloved in New York. The captain, yeah. Well, and he's drafted, awesome. developed, sixty-two yeah. home runs. Yeah, and they said this is as far as we can go. He was older at the time; he was thirty, I believe, when he signed that deal. He was, yeah, exactly. So Soto has that going for him, but. Soto's not like known as a Yankee yet. Where Judge, that's exactly what he was, and that's how, what they were signing. Well, speaking of that, how come the, the contract extensions or the contracts for Bo and Vladdy don't come up a lot here? They have two more years of control. I would think it would be. They a haven't won conversation, but I guess it's not automatic anymore. Well, they're also they haven't proven to be as good as the players we're talking about right now. True. Like Vladdy and Bichette are not the equivalent of Soto and Judge. True. Okay. And I think they're probably being a little bit patient here, trying to figure out where baseball is going. Yeah. Like if things are changing in baseball, you don't want to be the the last one to give out some crazy deal and then everything starts to revert. Yeah. And go a different direction. I, I would assume that that has to be a part of it. And it takes two to tango. The players can gamble on themselves as well. Well, and you still don't know what they are, right? You have to have that answer pretty soon though, don't you? Like they've been in the league for quite some time. Yeah. Maybe this is what they like, are. They're not kids anymore. Vladdy and Bichette are in their mid-20s. Like, if we feel like we know what Soto is, why don't we know what Vladdy is? Great question. I mean, if that's what they are, Mm -hmm. that's very good players, not great players. Not, like, superstar players. Just very good. Perennial all-stars are close to it. But not MVP candidates. And those guys shouldn't make that much money. Yeah. They'll make a boatload, and relatively speaking, they're going to be worth a fortune. Yeah. But you can't hand Vladdy a four hundred million dollar contract right no, but now. We talked about that. I remember talking to you about it on the show. Well, when he was chasing yeah. an MVP two yeah. years ago, it was like that's where he's going. Yeah, it was Tatis or signed that contract, ago. and we were like, "When's that coming for Vladdy?" Exactly. Well, and go out San Diego. How they feel about that now? Well, and they yeah they after the suspension, and Bogarts and, and yeah, Tatis and yeah, it's been a mess. All right, we'll come back with our best bets. Brought to you by FanDuel and Tee Up. Leafs Panthers overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. All right, today's best bets are powered by FanDuel. Make your picks and assemble a same game parlay in seconds on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Lots of Leafs tonight. William Nylander, four plus shots on goal. Mitch Marner, over two and a half shots on goal. And Austin Matthews, anytime goal scorer. He scores every night. Got to get to 70, doesn't he, Jonas? I wonder if he gets like... 71, like if he just scores twice. See, that's the thing. No one's saying, why would this guy stop at 70? Yeah. I but th- I think he if, has... he, if he scores tonight, he's not going to play tomorrow night. No, but like I think he could score. Why couldn't he score twice? Of course like, he could. It seems like every game when he gets one, he's getting. Yeah. He's going to have chances. Yeah. How many shot attempts did he have against Detroit? 15. 15 shot attempts. Yeah. He's just ripping shots on And net. he had, think, like they weren't just attempts. He had great Great chances. opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been electric. That the roof would have popped off yes, if he if he had scored an overtime. The reaction to him getting sixty nine was as loud as I've heard it for a regular season game. Like because everyone realized I now he's can remember he's on the verge of doing something. Yeah. Uh, today's best bets powered by FanDuel. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app today and find thousands of ways to play. Please play responsibly. Nineteen plus and physically located in Ontario. That's what he represents. Like he's just he's an all time great Leaf already, and you're never gonna forget this season. Where it's it's really broken the topic of apathy, which I really appreciate greatly yeah. because you know the last number of years it's always been wait for the playoffs. Who cares? People have been caught up in this storm. It's incredibly captivating. You can't look away, and you're you're 
you're engaged and jacked up for regular season games. Yeah. It reminds me, actually, we were talking about Judge. It reminds me of the Judge home run chase. Exactly what it was. Exactly. And no one in New York was like, sit him down, you know. What about the ALDS? Don't don't make sure Judge doesn't play too much. You got to win a World Series. It's the exact same thing. Him chasing Maris. Although Matthews isn't chasing anyone in particular. No, just like a hollowed arc. Yeah. yeah. But you get to 70, you move into that next category. How many guys have scored 70? Not many. Eight. Eight players prior to him. We keep just speaking it into existence that it's just naturally going to happen. It's just difficult to bet against the guy. Like you said, he scores every night. Yeah. He scored, I think he is like, it's almost a goal per game for four and a half months. Yeah. Yes. Like he had that one little dip where there were a couple games where he didn't score. And then it was like, ah, oh, it's probably over. Yeah. And then he had the two goal game about three weeks ago. And I was like, all right, it's back. We've been, talking, every game we've been talking 70 for like three months. Yeah. 70 for three months. And he's on the verge of it possibly happening tonight. You can hear it right here on TSN Radio. Lease Panthers tonight right here on TSN. You can watch the game on TSN 4. It's going to be outstanding. Jonas, great seeing you. Enjoy it. There it is. We will. Jonas Siegel of The Athletic. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes for helping out. We appreciate it. Everyone for tuning in today. Radio, TV, podcast, web. We appreciate that. We're out of here. Enjoy your evenings. Enjoy the games tonight. We're back tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll chat then.